This is JS Party, your weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. Merch alert! We have restocked. So if you've been waiting for a JS Party shirt in your size, now is the time to hit up jsparty.fm slash merch before they sell out again. Thank you to our partners for helping us bring you world-class developer pods each and every week. Fassy.com, fly to IO, and typesense.org. Okay, hey, it's party time, y'all. Hello, everyone. It's me, your host, Amal Hussein, back on a real mic. Still not home. One more day till I'm home in my own bed. <laughs> but I but I got my act together and I have a real mic using a Rode microphone. Very exciting and super excited, of course, about today's show and today's guests. Uh, but before I introduce them, let me introduce my co-pilot for the day, Nick Nisi. Hello. Welcome. Hoi hoi, Hamel. How's it going? It's going. It's going. You sound fantastic. Thank you. Yes. I'm, yeah, I just came back from Iceland. I've been in the United States for Ooh. less than 24 hours. Yes, 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 exactly. So jealous. I know. It's very exciting. Very exciting. But what's more exciting is I think our guest today and our topic. Mm-hmm. And so everyone, we're listening to JS Party. You all know that. Weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. And with us today to celebrate the most beautiful part of the web, like the most misunderstood, but the most important and impactful and just like not even the dessert it's like the i don't even know i can't it's the icing on the cake it's all the things we're gonna be talking about all the new things uh in the in css world with our resident expert yuna kravitz hello welcome yuna hello thank you so much for having me i think one of my favorite things ever lately is talking to javascript developers about css and ui and how much has evolved in the last few years so very happy to be on the show very excited to be here I, I will say I have been on the show for uh, Front End Feud lately, which has been fun. Yeah, our, our reigning champ too, CSS Pod. Ooh. You know, not surprised. I mean, but I have I haven't been on the chat with you all yet, so I'm excited to be. Here. I know. I was like, you know, you know, like you're probably the person who's actually been on the show the most statistically. I think you're like the most like <laughs> no like way. yeah. I think so. I think in total in totality and definitely for this year because I looked that up and I was like, whoa, like you know, you've been on the show a lot, but we haven't actually talked to you in a non-competitive way, you know, like we were always putting you on the spot. So it's like nice to see. A very competitive show, <laughs> quote unquote. Quote unquote, right. But but anyway, so so even though our audience might be familiar with you, um, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. So hi, I'm Yuna and I lead the UI DevRel team at Google, which is a part of Google Chrome. We work on the web platform and we mostly focus on making it easier for developers to build robust and really interactive and beautiful web experiences. And the whole goal that we have is to help developers make things easier. So make it easier to build things that are performant, accessible, uh, work well, look fluid like they want it to, because the web is a hard place and it's constantly evolving. When we stop evolving, then things get stagnant and we want to keep evolving and meet developers where they are. Yeah, absolutely. And and I would say that for me, the most exciting innovations I've seen on the web platform have actually come out of like uh, the CSS working group over the, over the past few years. It feels like we were getting not a ton of innovation in CSS. JavaScript was getting a lot of love. And then all of a sudden now it's like CSS is kind of having its shining moment. And same thing for HTML, you know, a lot of really great work happening kind of improve interoperability and like give some love to like form elements and it's very, very exciting stuff. And so that's what we're here to kind of unpack with you today, which is like catch us up on all the all the new CSS things, because um, I'm really embarrassed to admit this, but like this is like for me, this is it's not my Achilles heel, but I'm just so pulled into kind of like <laughs> JavaScript infrastructure and architecture and all these kind of other problems that I don't get to spend enough time kind of finessing with CSS and kind of mastering it. And, and one of my goals this year is to kind of like become like a CSS ninja. I don't know if those two words have ever been put together, but like, I want to be that. I want to be that girl. I want to be that girl. Like, you know, that's like in my head, I can be that girl, but I'm not there yet. So I'm hoping that this is the entryway gateway show to get me there, uh, you know. Well, I will say one, there's a lot to talk about. But also, I think that something I've seen in the JavaScript community is this sort of 
disregard almost of CSS because it's viewed as like not as serious. It's not like you're, you know, using it to build logic. But there's a lot of stuff that you have to do in JavaScript right now that's moving over to CSS in a much more declarative way. That's actually a lot more performant because the browser can handle it. That's easier to make accessible because the browser can handle it again. Oh, yeah. Um, and so I think that the best way to sort of level up your skill set as a developer, especially as someone who focuses on JavaScript, is to learn about and utilize these new CSS primitives because they make your life easier. Oh, yeah. They make it easier to architecturally write styles, to have logic imbued in your components, to build interactions. Like there's so much here that I this is why I love talking to JavaScript developers about the UI space is because they it's so hard to do stuff in JavaScript. Yeah, you're woman explaining <laughs> to a group of people that have been using hammers uh, when they should be using like needles. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. And really, it, it really feels like anything that I, I figure out at some point that I can do it in CSS over JavaScript. It's like, oh, sweet. I get that for free. Like, I don't right. have to think about it. It just works. And it's going to work in like a, a platform way that feels like it's meant to be that way rather than me trying to handle something weird in JavaScript. So I always love that. Yeah. And it's not just like making things easier that you can do in JavaScript. There's also new features that you just couldn't do at all in the web platform oh, wow. before, like new colors. Yeah. <laughs> like before we had expanded color spaces that you could set as backgrounds or as text colors. You just physically couldn't get that color to appear in your website. You could get a photo onto the website that you're serving where your user can see that color, but you couldn't make the background match the photo. It, it's There's so many new things. Yeah, no, that is that is so cool. And, and and just really mega kudos to the browser engineers that have um, really worked on this really difficult stuff. I mean, oh my God, can you imagine writing C, C++ to like create like composites? <laughs> Like, you know, to like manage a rendering <laughs> engine, like, like, it's like basically like a pixel dart gun, you know, but like using, um, you know, low level programming language to write that, like, I can't even imagine what that's like. So just like, kudos, kudos, kudos to them as well. Um, thank you. Thank you to all the folks funding this work as well. I know folks from companies like Egalia and Boku have also just generally been contributing to the web platform. And so just, you know, let's like keep that going. So before we dive into CSS, I'm sorry, I'm really distracted by your background, Yuna. Um, I just want to like take a minute to acknowledge you have this like wall of like conference Dog. badges and <laughs> great plushies. We'll see if we can get a, a, a screenshot of this uh, uh, to, to folks. But yeah, can we, can we just take a minute this to acknowledge how awesome your background is? <laughs> Thank you. I have a little little space in my one bedroom apartment that I kind of walled off and it works really nicely. I just made a little office in it. Yeah. Well, it's lovely. Uh, I'm all my conference badges are shoved into like some plastic bin somewhere, so I'm going to display them now for full like in in full glory, you know. <laughs> this is like a less than $20 like one of those accordion hangers. Yeah. I, I Oh, I good to... it was really cheap and I just put all the badges on it. So, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to do like a beaded doorway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a beaded doorway with conference badges. Yeah. I grew up in a house with a beaded doorway. Oh, awesome. gosh. All right. Well, so we're going to, I'm following a list of uh, 20 what's most exciting and impactful. Like it's a blog post that came out on the um, Chrome developers site. And uh, Una is one of the authors. And so we'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, so Una, feel free to like pick a random one to start with, or we can go in order, like, or we can go with your favorites, like y your call. So wh what do we want to start with? Okay. So I will give you categories and you tell me what category you want to start with. How does that, that sound? sounds excellent? And I'm going to let Nick pick because yeah. Oh, no. Yes. Love it. So the first general category is architectural foundations of CSS. Mm. So this is things like nesting or scope or uh, cascade layers, things like that, or trigonometric functions. Those That's a whole underlying like architectural foundation of writing CSS. Mm -hmm. The second category is components. So we could talk about all the new work in component space, like popover, select list that's still getting worked on, anchors getting worked on. So that's a little bit more experimental right now. Popover did land and a lot of animation capabilities Ooh. for that. Interaction is another category. So we could talk about view transitions and scroll driven animations mm. and animating in and out. So like entry and exit animations, animating to and from display none. That's a whole category. And then um, responsive design. 
I'll give you as the last category. That's everything that's like container queries, logical components with has, everything in that space. There's new media queries too. So I think that those are four high level categories that probably the listeners of the show would be the most interested in. Yeah. Oh, that sounds great. Well, Nick, tough decisions to make. Oh, it is. I thought for sure one of the spaces or one of the categories was going to be just colors <laughs> in general. We could talk about uh, color too. Color is a, a whole category. So we, we can, can start end with, with that. color. That could be our dessert. How about that? Okay. Yeah. Colors is definitely the one that frightens me the most just because I have no idea <laughs> what the difference is between them all. Uh, and I, I think we've talked to, to Adam Argyle about him before uh, and it's still just whoosh, straight over my head. So <laughs> let, let's just start with color because I, I could be quick about it. I think the best way to find out the answer to that is to play with dev tools. We have really good dev tools for color. Yeah. And you like color is very ahead and very behind at the same time um, because you have these new color spaces that you can use like OKLCH or OKLab and those tend to be the ones that are generally considered the best color spaces to use and to mix colors Wait, in. Wait, what are color spaces? This We're going to have to like level this <laughs> talk down a few notches. <laughs> you know? So if you've ever used like RGB oh, I see. or hex, which is RGB or HSL, like HSL and RGB are two different color spaces that you could work in. Mm -hmm. And now we have the capability to have a much wider number of color spaces that oh. you can s create colors in, but also interpolate between colors. So for things like animating color or transitioning in a gradient, you can set what color space you're doing that in. And um, in the color world, there's also this new color function that's in all browsers, which is called color mix. And color mix lets you take two colors and mix them with using a percentage of each. So you can create these dynamic color themes with like one color and create the complement of it. You could create like a alpha mix percent of it by mixing with transparency. And now we have relative color syntax that lets you take channels from that color and shift them. So there's a ton of new color capabilities. There's great dev tools for picking color. The web color picker is still behind dev tools in Chrome dev tools because you can't pick like the OKLCH OK color space, these HD color spaces in the default color picker, which needs to change ultimately. But the tooling provides it. And yeah, Adam was on the show. He probably has a lot more to say about that topic because he is our resident color expert and knows all the things about color. Uh, you can also follow the work of Leah Veru and Crystal Lee, who've been working on the color spec for a long time. Um, and they have color tools too, Color.js. So we can add some links for the show notes. But the thing to know about colors is we have new color spaces and color functions to help you dynamically create color themes. And the last piece of that, which hasn't been implemented yet, um, is contrast color. So being able to automatically have contrasting colors uh, based on a, a list of colors that you provide. Wow. It's like basically a design system. You can just, it's like a turnkey design system where you just like, you're able to just say, here are my base colors. And now just like, give me the right contrasts. Like, that's so cool. And like, what about accessibility? Like, is the accessibility built into kind of the generated contrasts? Are they accessible by default? Right. So that's the thing that's been most hotly contested mm. in the working group is how those percentages or that um, accessible like number that swaps the colors is determined. Because I'm sure Adam talked about this, but there's existing color contrast algorithms that some argue are outdated. They don't work great with some types of colors. And there's work to be done that's being done right now to generate new contrast algorithms. But those haven't been adopted yet by law. Like those haven't been formalized and finalized. So there's sort of this space in between where you can specify. I don't know what the state of this actually is. I used to be a lot more involved. But um, that was a discussion when I was more involved in it was like being able to specify the contrast algorithm, but then there's a default algorithm the browser provides. That contrast work has not been implemented yet. Yeah. Wow. I'm fascinated by this personally, because I think this kind of pattern of like, okay, we have a default behavior, but then give developers a, an out, you know, let them kind of override it, pass things in. Like, I'm really glad we're trending towards that direction. Because for example, there's um, something going on right now in the web component space where they're trying to have a shadow DOM, like a shadow DOM out. The exact term is escaping me of what the name of the spec is, but basically it's like, we want to be able to break encapsulation for Shadow DOM, like if we choose to, right? And the reason being like developers have lots of good reasons for wanting to do this, you know, and 
like I say yes, right? But the the purists are like, no, this is bad. But I mean, at this point, like it's very clear that like developers want this and need this, and like hopefully it's going to happen. Like from I think it's like on the on the way to happening now. But I mean, but this idea of like, okay, give me a default behavior and then give me a patch, like give me a, a ladder out, like. I think that's like a good compromise, right? Because it's very hard to predict like how people are going to use something. And so I think for me, like extensibility and flexibility, like have to kind of really be key, like in order to to get adoption, you know? One of the biggest challenges in standards is figuring out how to make things future-proof. So that's one thing. Like we currently are facing a situation where we might have a change in contrast algorithms that will in the future potentially be the standard, but what happens if there's another change in contrast algorithms when we've done more research as a society and we know more about how the eye works? So that's always a challenge. Like I'm also part of the Open UI community group, which is trying to work on this component space. And so creating a solution for one component will eventually cascade, no pun intended with CSS, uh, to other components. So we figure out how to do like a drop down, like a select list. How does that work with combo box? How does that work with different types of selects and multi-select? And what does that all look like in combination? So it's really the goal is to create primitives that can be reused, but make sense and aren't too vague. It's like a fine line. Mm. And, and I think with the color work is a great example of making it so that you can have control, but also opening it to the future and future proofing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that that makes a ton of sense. So insightful. Thank you for sharing. So colors. Yay. New stuff. We'll put links in the show notes to all the things. (laughs) Uh, So I guess we're going to move on to our next category because we can like yo-yo. I'll I'll pick the next category and then you can do the next one, Nick, which I'd love to talk about the foundational stuff. Mm -hmm. Feels like a good place to start. Okay. So with foundations, there's a lot of things, right? I think some of the most interesting things are like nesting. So nesting is something that is now in all browsers. That's something that we didn't even think we could add to browsers, but our engineers are awesome. And like the Chrome engineers, the uh, Firefox engineers, the Safari engineers, like hats off to all the hard work that's being done there. So we can now have nesting in CSS where that's like an architectural thing where you could have a component and then say you have a card. So before you'd have to have card and then like card dot title and at the bottom of your style sheet for specificity you'd have like all the container queries and and media queries or if you have container queries too now you could nest that all inside of a card so if you're familiar with sas that's something you can do in sas also is you could nest styles it makes the code a lot neater it makes it a lot more legible especially with the nesting of states like hover and focus and then also your modifiers like your media queries or container queries and your other at rules, those will automatically go at the bottom of the rendered CSS. So um, that's all like the, one of the number one features developers have been asking for, for a long time. There is a key difference in the way that nesting works with CSS versus SAS, where with CSS, you can't do nesting of strings. So like in SAS, you could do loops and you could have like a interpolation of class names because it's a preprocessor it's going to process all that out into a single name before it's read by the browser so you can get these actual like uh, like bem style nesting if you're familiar with bem it's block element modifier naming class convention and you can't do that you can't like have naming named classes in css so that's just like a thing to note another neat thing with nesting is that it could potentially reduce your file size. Oh, yeah. So it could reduce the characters. And that's something that we're also like potentially looking into is, could we add this to minifiers as something that improves the file size of your CSS? Ooh, retrofitting nesting nice. via tooling. Oh, I love that. I, oh, yeah, I mean, it, it makes sense, right? It's like dry CSS, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. That's so cool. So that's another like potential behind the scenes thing too. Like with some of these architectural updates, it might not be something that you necessarily have to author, but it could be like a little enhancement, progressive enhancement under the hood. But this one I I like authoring with because I love being able to nest without having to require an additional uh, dependency and build system like tool to do it. Just do it with CSS. And is that available on all browsers now? Like, it's not just a Chromium thing. 
It's like in Firefox, it's in WebKit. Nesting is in all browsers. When it initially came out, it required an ampersand uh, for classes that don't have like any uh, syntax, like a dot or a hash or anything. So if you had like a main with a H1 inside, it would require an and in front of it, and space H1. That requirement is being removed and landing in all browsers with the update where you, it's called look ahead nesting, where you don't need to have the ampersand for components that don't have the syntax. And that's a change, but it's cool. So that's landing and um, is available cross browser. Is uh, places like caniuse.com still good re- uh, resources for this kind of usage information? Can I use should should be a good resource. There's also MDN uh, that looks at browser compat data. There's a whole initiative called Baseline, which is partnering with MDN to highlight things that are like newly interoperable or things that have support in all browsers. So that's something that you could also look at to get a sense. And they're they're growing in the number of pages that they support. So nice. Yeah. I could talk more about foundations. Sorry, I realized I was like, okay, nesting. But <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, we could talk more about yeah. foundations. I, I want to pivot real quick because I wanted to ask this earlier. And I'm sorry, listeners, if this is too much of a shift, but I have ADHD, so forgive me. <laughs> so I, I just really want to go back to like, you mentioned like future proofing. So it's like really hard to future proof for the web. And I'm curious, like how much you all leverage origin trials to kind of really get user feedback in the wild. And for those who are not familiar, origin trials are really cool. They came out of Google, but... I think um, you can do it on non-Chromium browsers too now. I think Firefox has it where you basically say, hey, I want to use this experimental feature. So instead of a user having to go into the browser and click the setting, it'll just automatically, it's like a feature flag for the web. Like it'll, if you register your domain, that experimental feature will be turned on specifically for users that log in to the, the, that domain using that that browser. Uh, and so I'm just curious, like have, have origin trials been helpful in kind of like ironing out some of these kinks? with these new CSS features? It really depends on the feature. I will say origin trials are used a lot less for CSS and UI features than they are for JavaScript features. I mean, for whatever reason that is, there's definitely a ton of user input. The features are in like nightly versions of browsers or the experimental versions like Firefox Nightly or Safari TP or Chrome Canary for a few cycles before they're stable usually. And also within the working group, there's a lot of people who are experts in the field who provide feedback, but it depends on the feature. I have worked on features that had origin trials. Some of them landed, some of them didn't. They tend to be more of the, what's the word? Spicy features, Mm. (laughs) contested features that would get origin trials to kind of iron them out. Well, because nothing beats user feedback, right? That's the thing. Like, yes, it's very hard to argue. I mean, nerds can argue all they want and bike shed all they want. But then when a user says like, no, this is great. Like, it's very hard to like, argue against a user user feedback. So that's why I find origin trials like really important and good for kind of like uh, shutting down nerd debates, you know? User feedback <laughs> is great for ergonomic feedback. So like how easy is this API to understand? Is it solving your use case? What exactly is your use case? Creating a list of requirements for a feature is something that we can get from user feedback. But in terms of like the future proofing, that's we don't know what's going to change in the future. So that's kind of something that you need to think about from the start. It's kind of like, you know, that uh, metaphor with accessibility being a blueberry muffin. I don't know that metaphor. I feel so bad. I'm totally blanking on who said this. This is a couple years ago at a conference, but the quote was like, if you're baking a blueberry muffin, you can't just add the blueberries on at the end. You have to bake them into the muffin. And that's what, how accessibility is. You have to bake it in from the start. So when we talk about accessibility or think of it that way, it's kind of like, with future proofing these APIs, you have to bake it in from the start. It's hard to retrofit sometimes. No, that, that, that makes sense. Well, thank you. I, I I can take us off this tangent. We can go back to foundations to back to our regularly scheduled programming. Um, thank you for that insight, you know. <laughs> so what, what else is in that category of foundational stuff, I guess? A fun one is that we now have trigonometric functions in CSS. So you can use trig functions like cosine, sine, pat, like all these trick functions in the calc Mm -hmm. function in CSS. So you can create like cool organic interfaces. One demo that I had made was like a popover with like a radial menu where things kind of move in like a circular pattern around the button, like a Pinterest menu. And you can calculate position based on sine and cosine, like around a circle that way. I've seen a lot of awesome demos from Anna Tudor and other people online. Uh, Bromis Van Dam has some cool demos too, where you can create like cool shapes 
And I love to see more organic sort of interfaces. So trig functions are cool. You don't have to like calculate the styles in JavaScript and then send that information back to CSS to position things. You can now just do it in CSS, which is awesome. There's advances to nth selections. So you could do like nth of type, which is neat, just like a asterisk there. So that's useful if you have, like say you work in publishing and you have like an article and you have an interspersed like either ads or other types of things in between. You can target things a little bit more cleanly. Like I used to work in publishing. That's, that's the thought that I had where I was like, oh, you could skip those. Scope is another one. That one's only in Chrome right now. Uh, this one lets you scope your styles. So it's a little bit more accurate to a section. So this is kind of like, like what you'd want to do with like if you, in, in JavaScript, like if you keep your styles in one file, like oftentimes it will scope it, right? So it'll give it like a class name that's like specific to that file. So if you don't have access to that or you want to do it a different way, or you have multiple things that you want to scope within the same file, then you could do it in CSS. Like that's just like one of those missing features that is now provided without additional what what are they called? Dependencies. That's the word. Yeah. So can you can we double click on that? So scoping, like how what does scoping look like if I were to kind of like try to scope something like because I mean I'm, I'm trying to think of scoping like I think of like scoping as like adding um, inline styles to an element <laughs> it's like a way of scoping CSS or using a very specific ID or class name right like so what's the value add here for ways that people have been scoping in the past like what's the value add now is there just like a way to scope more elegantly I guess Yes. So there's different ways to do things. There's no real way to scope right now in CSS. Like the way that you do it is you add classes or you do something else that you have to kind of override it or um, like make your own solution. So I think this API will mostly be used by libraries and people who are developing systems for CSS. But the way to do it would be to add at scope rules that you can then scope things like at scope for a light theme or a dark theme or at scope to a card. And then things inside of that card would be isolated inside of that scope. And then you can also have like donut scope where you uh, pop out of the scope. So this is an API that is something that I'm not even that deep into, but it's something that's like missing from the platform, which provides native scoping capabilities. Hmm. It's like reverse shadow DOM. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, but for CSS, you can, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you can create your own enclosed scope. I think that this is a good time to note too that it might feel like there's a lot of stuff to learn, like a lot of capabilities, but you don't have to use all of them. Like use what makes sense for you. Mm -hmm. And there are some APIs that are landing that might be more useful for say library developers. There's some that are more everyday UI friendly. So there's so many things to consider browser support, your your personal browser matrix, what your needs are. I feel like everyday UI friendly needs to be a, a ca uh, internet cafe for front end <laughs> developers. <laughs> like, everyday UI. Get my Java from there, you know, <laughs> Java yeah. beans. There's a lot of yeah. things like that in JavaScript too that land uh, and you're like, okay, how am I going to use this? And it's things like symbols or uh, generator functions and like symbols in particular seem like a more library specific thing that you probably wouldn't use every day. Uh, and this kind of feels like that. Atomics. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to build my, my rest, my crud app with atomics. <laughs> <laughs> but th this feels, I was like, when I first saw it and saw the description in the article, I was like, how is this different than nesting? But I think that the light and dark example kind of helps me to differentiate between when I'd use one or the other. Uh, so that was really cool. Another thing that's in this category is also like cascade layers, which might also seem like it does the right, th the same thing, but it does a very different thing. Cascade layers. Oh yeah, that that is cool. That is very cool, especially for third party development and in general. Like I, yes, I I was very excited about cascade layers, but you can tell everyone about what they are. Nice. No, I'm glad that you found use for it because I think extremely. That's one thing. That, like you either see it and you're like, this is exactly what I needed, or you don't really know how to use it. But basically, let's say control the cascade. So while we're talking about specificity before cascade layers, it's all one layer for the developer. Like you have access as a developer to essentially one layer. There's also other layers like the user agent styles, like what comes from Chrome or Safari or Firefox. And um, then there's user custom styles. <laughs> That's so funny. I have the new. new yeah, I was going to say, do you have bubbles? Do you have bubbles <laughs> popping up on your screen? It's it's the Apple <laughs> update. It does. It also when I do this, it'll do like a. It does like a. I'll just Fire sit here like this. Just... Eventually, it'll happen. If you know, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
cascade layers let you control the cascade. <laughs> and uh, that means that anything inside that layer is only going to be scoped to the specificity of that mm-hmm. layer. And different layers have different precedents. There's user agent styles, there's users custom styles, and then there's d- developer styles. And now within the developer or author styles, like you could have different layers so they don't have unexpected overrides somewhere yeah. else. Mm-hmm. But you also have to know how to use layers because you might be like, wait, why the why the specificity is over here, but it's in a higher layer. Like it, it'll win because you're layering it to win. So it could be a great way to organize your code. Mm-hmm. It's also something that you kind of have to like learn how to use right or you might not realize what it's doing but yes another another tool in the arsenal of foundations i have a question on this with uh like like the the layers like the user agent layer and like a components layer those make sense to me and maybe it's because i'm familiar with the concept through like tailwind i think you can specify different layers within that and the i could be wrong but the way i that that i think about that at least in terms of like tailwind is like this stuff is going to load first and then it's going to apply this stuff. So that specificity will, will be controlled by that. Is there a way to control? Like when you have, if you had several different layers that are all like your own custom ones controlled, this one's going to be take precedence over this other one. Yes. That's exactly what it does. Oh, cool. How do you control like which one loads first, I guess, or so orders first? at the top of your file, you'd have a at layer and then you would list it in a row. Okay. So you could do at layer, third party code, normalized, base styles, components, and then you could nest layers too. So you could have like wow. components.header, components.footer, and like nest it within that kind of layer scope. It would still be ordered within that layer, but it, it might be more neat than writing like header, footer, comma, like et cetera. So yeah, it's one liner where you could set up all your layers either at the top of your file Or it'll be at the moment that the layer is created. So you could have at layer, I don't know, say base, and then have all the styles. And underneath that, another file have at layer footer. And then base will come before footer because it's how you authored it. But to just have control, like in your, you know, main.css file, you should just at the top have your layers like in order. Another note is unlayered styles will always win over layered styles. And this is one of those future-proofing things where it's easier to add layers to your code base by making them beneath your other custom styles. So like third-party code, normalize, resets, those sort of things could be layered and not override your new styles. So the decision was made by the working group to have them have lower precedence when you've layered than your unlayered styles. So it's easier to add code. So great for design system teams too. Like, you know, like I want, because that's one of the struggles right now with the many design systems teams is, you know, they really want to be able to force, um, not JavaScript. They want to bang important their CSS, right? I mean, let's be honest, these are JavaScript developers, so they're probably using JavaScript for their CSS, but <laughs> feel called out. Besides the point, okay. <laughs> And so it's like, okay, well, like, how do I get these darn developers that are using my components to stop butzing about? I don't want, you know, use my, I want my spacing, I want my padding, I want my, my rules, you know, and so that's always a struggle. And so design systems seems like that I've worked with in the past, they're always kind of, their North Star is like, we don't want any CSS anywhere in the app. Like we want you guys using our classes or our components, and that's it, you know, and I'm like, I, I get that. But you know, it's hard, hard to enforce that. So I feel like layering is going to really help kind of set those boundaries for teams. But also more importantly, for me, it, it's, um, I've written a certain, decent amount of kind of third party code, you know, like either we are writing a an SDK that like lives on someone else's machine or lives on someone else's site, or, or vice versa. And so like, how, or, or I'm using a third, third party code. And so this really feel like, it helps me organize like that, that story as well. Like, you know, how do I not like have a clash unintentionally and sometimes going with full shadow Dom, like it's a bit heavy. Right. Uh, And also has some other trade-offs. So I don't know, this was super exciting for me and uh, you know, I'm really glad uh, to see it landing. And so is it in all browsers now? Like everybody? Yes. This also landed last year in all browsers. So it's, it's available since 2022. Oh, nice. And it's funny that you mentioned bang important <laughs> because that's another thing that I don't think most developers understand how it works. <laughs> you want to please educate us, <laughs> uh, you know. So I think that most developers think that adding important just makes that line of code have a higher specificity than other mm-hmm. things, right? And that's because that's all the control that we currently okay. had. But what Bang Important does is it actually inverts the cascade and creates a new layer. Mm. So that means that if you have user agent styles with with Bang Important on it, they will have the highest possible precedence. 
more precedence than the developer styles with being important on it. And that means that user agent styles, like users' custom styles that have important on it, have a higher precedence than developer authored styles with important on it. To be clear, you're, when you're talking about user, you're talking about the user, like the like Yuna has some settings and Yuna's customs Chrome settings are going to be like bang important. Yes. And yeah, because there's the precedence is like user styles, then browsers. I don't even know. Browser styles. Browser and styles, then, users, custom styles, and then developers, author oh, styles. Okay. Okay. And then it inverts for important. So important things are then developers, important styles users' custom important styles, and then user agents' important styles. Okay? Does that make sense? When would a user agent ever be so loud where they were like, listen, I'm Mozilla and, you know, I want it this way. Like, when would when would that ever happen? Um, there's a, I think that there's a few importance for uh, language directional oh, things and I think some components. Like some just like default, like make the web work. Things. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, I can totally see like uh, people messing up like Arabic or Urdu or something like that and being like, no, like, yeah, like developers would want to have it go from like right to like left to right as opposed to right to left or something like that. So that makes sense. Yeah, like you can't change like left to right to go right to left or something. Right, like right, that. right. Yes, yes. <laughs> right. You can't break the web for users. Like, got it. I don't know if that one specifically, I don't have it in front of me, but I know there are some, okay. like very few, and they're for good reason. Of course. But with layers, that also means that we invert the cascade for it being important. So if you have your base layers that are your lowest precedence layer, and you have something that's important on the base layer, it's going to have more precedence than something that is unlayered that has important on it. Okay even though that's a technically a higher layer without important on it. So it inverts the cascade. Okay, great. So this is definitely a podcast where you want to make sure you had your morning coffee. And uh, <laughs> I have a diagram that I can okay. share with you that makes it a lot more clear. We will put this in the show notes. <laughs> so no one yeah, has to... I also have a YouTube video about we this. We will put that also in the show notes. So nobody has to worry about um, Inception, you know, because I feel like I'm in Inception every time I talk about layers and inversion. I'm like, okay, I'm here now. And now I'm not here because I'm in this other place. And now we're also in this other place. Like it's very, it's mentally, it's hard. But, you know, that's why we have you on the show to help make it less hard. So, But CSS is easy. It is, yeah. You know, we need we need T-shirts that say that, you know. <laughs> we need a marketing, we need a marketing initiative around that. Because <laughs> trust me, you have developers writing over engineering with JavaScript that like can't do basic CSS, you know. So we definitely have a bit of a marketing problem here. But all right, so is, is that it for foundations? I, I think probably yes for stuff that's new. But I think so. Okay, so yeah. Next category is on you, Nick Nisi. Oh, um, well, as someone who fancies themselves a React developer, let's talk about components. Okay, cool. Components are an area that I'm very, very excited about. There's been like smaller updates to browser components. There's some like bigger ones. I think that the biggest thing that has landed this year is Popover so far, which is only in two browsers, Safari and Chrome. But Popover is an attribute that lets you create elements that live in the top layer. So that's one thing that you get for free. You don't have to worry about the Z index. It lets you uh, get keyboard navigation for free. So you could like tab in, tab out, you get the double toggle, escape key management. You don't have to handle any of that. And if you have a default popover, you could set it to manual so it doesn't do this, but you can get free light dismiss or click away. So when you click away, it closes that popover. You get all of this very declaratively. You can also have um, like actions to just close, you could do toggle popover actions, and you don't have to have any JavaScript to manage all of these different states and create these components. And it's so cool because the way you write it is like very declarative. You just put popover as an attribute on the thing that's popping over, and that could be like a tooltip or a menu or like any kind of like a chat box, whatever you want it to be. And then you give that an ID, and then the button that opens it, you would just have the popover toggle target equals that ID, and that's it. And then you have a popover. And it's very, very cool. Um, it is a behavioral thing, so you still have to add semantics if it's like a menu. If it's something like a dialog, you probably want to use the dialog element. And if you are creating a list of options to select, we're working on another element called select list, which is a little bit earlier in the stage, it's not actually landed stable in any browsers yet, but that will allow you to create customizable drop-down menus where you could make 
any arbitrary content inside the dropdown without having to break it and build it from scratch or use a library. Just like do it in the browser. Also, that's that's the goal to do that declaratively. And obviously you can fully style that. Yes, exactly. Ah. So you could recreate like the GitHub dropdown where it has um, merge commit and then some description. It's like blue and there's a check mark. You could do all of that. I've built a ton of demos. Uh, I can share the link to that code pen collection also where I created like the Airbnb selector where it's like a bunch of countries and it's just all inside of a select list element with a selected option element that may or may not stay. So that shows a reflected option and you could choose to hide or show whatever you want in there or style it any different way you want. And then the button to open it, you can also style. So there's these different pieces. Wow. So just to be clear, so this is, so first of all, I'm just like mind blown at this because I'm like, I'm thinking of how much JavaScript and CSS and HTML can be deleted from the web now that this is kind of built in, like legit. And just to kind of clarify this, like this is like a little bit of um, a crossover between HTML and CSS, right? Because popover is an attribute that you have to put on an HTML element. That's HTML. Right. And so, yeah, so you need that like attribute and there's no kind of equal something, right? Like it's it's just like a, an attribute with the default value. Like there's no properties that you assign to that attribute, right? Right. So that's just the attribute. And then you have some events like popover, toggle target. There's other attributes that you can add. The CSS part of it is that you have a new pseudo class called popover open, which works similarly to the dialog open class, but it's specific to popovers. And that's required to style the popover when it's open. And then there's other new CSS that lets you style the interactive popover. And that also works for dialogues. It works for any element that you're transitioning in from display none to the page, which is things like starting style. It's an at starting style rule. So you can tell the browser what the state is before it animates in. So that would be like if you have a popover that starts in the bottom of the screen off screen and goes up to the middle, you'd want it to say that it starts at the bottom. So you might have a transition where you're translating the X or Y from 100% like off screen to zero. Yeah. So that's one thing you could do with starting style. Then you have also this new ability to animate discrete properties, where that means you could animate to and from display none, content visibility, and add that to the timeline of animation. So now you could have like opacity being on the, the timeline of animation along with display, kind of going from, from and to display none. And then there's also... The overlay property, which lets you animate things like the backdrop and kind of tells the browser that you want something to stay in the top layer while it's animating. So it doesn't hide right away and then animate. It is also staying in the top layer throughout the animation. So there's a couple of CSS things that are working in conjunction with the new component things. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is so cool. Um, and like... My gosh, just having this built in. I'm like, why did it take this long to like have this? Because we've we've needed this. We've been we've needed this a long time, right? So why 2023? You know? <laughs> well, uh, there's there's an answer. <laughs> we've been wanting this for a long time, but over the past few years, especially the past seven years up to 2021. <laughs> seven years. Yeah, welcome to the standards world, right? It's like 15 years later. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think it's eight years, actually. Chrome specifically, and other browsers probably as, as well, I just don't know the details as well, have been going through a pretty robust rendering engine update, like under the hood, while we've all been using Chrome. It's called Rendering NG. There's different parts like Layout NG and other features, but it's enabled stuff to be like this, like specifically things like container queries to be written in a way that can be decently performant. Like not all of it is like hugely performant, right? That we add to the browser, but the new rendering engine allows for it to have a solid solution. And there's also a lot of um, boundaries that are sort of put in place for something like container queries. So you have to have containment and those features, like features built on top of other features. So we had to have containment first, which lets you isolate paint or style within the DOM. And then on top of that, you can build another feature like container queries. It lets you create these like different styles. So I think that that's a big part of it. It's hard. Standards takes a long time. Like the components work is sort of separate from all of that. Like that's just takes a long time to try to make dropdowns customizable. Um, But then at the same time, there's been updates to the rendering engine that have enabled us to build things in at a faster rate that are more performant. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I get it. This stuff's hard. And I, my question was really part rhetorical, but I, I really did appreciate hearing that answer from you in the sense that like, no, no, no. I, mean, this stuff <laughs> I, I wasn't is hard. sure if you were on no, the real No, no, I really did. No, I, I did and I didn't, right? Like in the sense that like, I, I, I get that this is hard and I think it's important for people to know why. And so I, I appreciate you sharing that context. I think yeah. for, yeah, for me, it's like, I'm just curious, how many popovers can you have on one page? I mean, you, you can have. Well, so there's a pseudo class. I guess, how do you spec? you just use like an IDE or something or, an, or something to further specify the pseudo, like when you, if you're working with a pseudo class? It depends on how you write it. You can have popovers open other popovers. <laughs> oh my they, would, they would all be Pop in the reception. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, like you, you would have to open a popover and then like open another popover. But yeah, you can do that. Default popovers will close others. Is there a Z index? In the top layer. <laughs> but yeah, it, it depends on how you write it by default. They'll close others. You could, you could change that. It's up to the user. This is awesome. Forget about AI taking our jobs. It's CSS coming to make sure I never have to write another select. Make our jobs yeah. easier. <laughs> Come on, fireworks. <laughs> but for job security, of course, JavaScript engineers are still going to make it complicated. So, you know, don't get too excited, you know, you know, <laughs> just because just you give people good solutions doesn't mean they're going to take them. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, there's a lot to talk about. I feel like we've already been talking for a while, probably the good part of yeah, an hour. We're, and we're, we're not, we're just, we're just, just, just scratching, hitting. scratching the surface. <laughs> I know for the sake of time, we're going to have to start to, to stick with your favorites, I suppose. But, um, all right. Is there anything else new in component land? There's a couple of smaller things. So, um, also like in, well, there's one more big thing. I'll talk about that first. Like anchor positioning is, Similar to select list, not in browsers yet. It almost landed in Chrome, but there was a, a big chunk of feedback that came in the CSS working group to make a lot of changes to the spec, and it kind of had to go back to the drawing board. And a lot of the features that are in Chrome now, I think all of them are staying, but there's going to be new features added that make anchoring better. And a lot of, well, anchor positioning lets you anchor things to other elements, which is used widely. That'd be like a tool tip or? Tool tips, even like notifications, menus, like a little profile icon. And the other cool thing is you could declaratively have the layout of that change if you run out of screen space, for example. So like you could use the viewport to actually reposition it without any JavaScript. You don't need to have libraries. Like you could do this all in CSS, even in a line of code that's coming, like just to auto flip. And it's so cool. And there's a, a part of the new proposal is like a tether pseudo element. So you could create an arrow, which would then auto flip to match the flip. So you don't have to do any of that in JavaScript. You don't have to rewrite all these rules of resize observation and, and all of that, like scroll observation for your popovers, like your little tooltips. It's going to be something you can do in CSS and HTML, like connecting it in HTML with the anchor and then applying the styles in CSS. Or you could connect them in CSS too. <laughs> There's it's a whole new world. Um, so that's a big a whole one. New world. <laughs> about to start. About to start singing some some Disney tunes here soon. You know, it really is a whole new world. Yeah, dibs on Jasmine. <laughs> Nick. I call it a, a golden era for web Yes, UI. yes. Oh, I love that. Oh, that's a great talk title, Yuna. That'd be a good keynote. I've definitely should, used it in slides. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you should, this should like keynote. I would watch that keynote. That's fascinating. So should we move on to, uh, let's see, I guess I'm next for uh, categories. Interactivity, I think, sounded good. And maybe we can end it with the container stuff since that's, I think, the last one. Yeah. The media stuff. But yeah, interactivity. What's new? What's new there? Okay. So with interactivity, the first one is the linear easing function, which is a really cool way to create custom easings and animations. So you might be familiar with linear as a easing function for animations, which means it goes like straight from like zero to one, right? Now that's a keyword, linear keyword. Now you can use linear as a function and have a unlimited list of values that actually plots values on a chart. So you can create like bounces and create other cool transitions. And there's a, uh, if you, want to play with it, I recommend DevTools because in Chrome DevTools, there's a tool that lets you do the linear easing function. And there's a couple of defaults that you can play with in there and then move things around. Uh, so that's neat. And um, Jake Archibald also created a tool, uh, linear easing generator. I'll try to get a link for the show notes. And it's available in um, Chrome and Firefox right now. It's a linear function. That's very, very cool. And what's what? What do you see as a practical use case for this, like for developer teams? 
Like what, what, what JavaScript am I going to delete, basically? <laughs> You're going to delete any custom easings. Well, you can't do this okay. right now in CSS. Oh, I see, I see. So if you wanted to create some kind of like custom like bounce easing or other type of mm -hmm. easing, you would have to do it in, Java, in JavaScript and then animate that way. Or have a library. You probably are using like GSAP or another library to do this kind of thing right now. Makes sense. Wow. Another uh, neat thing is scroll-driven animations landing in CSS. So those are in Chrome right now. And that enables you to create what it sounds like, which is scroll-based animation experiences. So instead of just time-based animations where it relies on a timer, it can apply the animation based on a scroller. So your scroller could be the viewport, have things animate in and out and kind of like fade in or anything. Like it's CSS, so you could style it anyway. You can create like sticky elements that like kind of go in. Then when you hit a certain point in the scroller, they scroll away. So you can create like these really cool sort of scrolly telling experiences without any JavaScript. You could do this without any other dependencies in CSS. You get a lot of control there, like all the scroll driven fun that you could want. That's so cool. Um, I mean, I can see so many different use cases for that. Essentially, it's kind of just giving us a hook into an event, right? And we get to now like do whatever we want when we have the access to that event. That's really neat. Yeah. So two cool things. One is uh, I want to share a site with you called scroll-driven-animations.style. And that is by Brahmas Van Dam, who put together a bunch of demos. And um, there's like videos on how to use this and like lots of examples here. So that's really cool. Another cool thing is that if you use this new API, which you can use in CSS or in JavaScript, it is much more performant than the current existing JavaScript uh, way to do it uh, because you are not hogging up the main thread. Like this is browser accelerated. And there's uh, also an article from Yuriko on our team who works with partners who did a case study on that. So there's also performance benefits to using these new APIs, not only developer experience benefits, but also performance improves. Yeah, so essentially, I think the magic of this was that you could previously do this with JavaScript, but you're now able to do this purely in CSS. And from what you're saying, like it's optimized, like GPU optimized CSS, which is like the way we want to go, right? Yes. And um, I think that the main thing isn't just like, oh, you can do it in CSS, not JavaScript. It's really letting you separate your application styles from your application logic. So you don't have to cut like, Currently, there's a lot of like confuscation because you just couldn't do things in CSS and HTML declaratively before. Like you had to have styles mixed in with your application logic. And that's something that I don't think makes a ton of sense as we move forward into application development. So I think that not only are there these developer experience benefits, performance benefits, but it also lets you better architect your application. 100%. Like, could not have said that better. So let's see, we are on interactive. We've covered so much ground and my head is spinning. <laughs> I think we have room for a few more things. So container queries uh, or, or media queries, What what's new there? Well, lasting interactions is view transitions, but I'll let you explore okay. those <laughs> on your own. They do involve JavaScript. Uh, they're just a new way of transitioning between states that our magical yeah view transitions oh yeah we've talked a, we've talked a bit about that on the show and we'll link to the notes we haven't done an extensive deep dive but it's really exciting to see frameworks like astro and svelte like kind of start to uh ship with the support it's very cool yeah and then the last one is i was gonna say do you want to just do like a quick one-liner for folks just on what view transitions are from your words, like from your mouth, I mean, I should say. <laughs> well, I would say I know they're running out of time, so I'm like trying to just be like, boo, boo, boo. Um, but view transitions, they let you transition between states and then customize how that transition is applied. So uh, it's essentially like browser managed interaction where you could just wrap a you know, remove event or a like some other DOM event in a view transition. So you do document start view transition and it's magic. It's pure magic when you start using them because it creates this really smooth shift from one thing to another. You can use them within components. It doesn't have to be a full page transition. And they currently work for single page apps, like within your SPA and we're working on multi-page apps. So that's, that's next. So you could transition between pages. Yeah, like server rendered, which was like, you weren't able to do that. But now because you have access to the browser events, you can do that, which is very exciting. All right. So container queries or media queries or que inter whatever, like responsiveness, like responsive design, RIS RISD, 
What's new there? Lots of stuff. Responsive design. It's, it's, I get loopy after a while talking about this stuff because there's just <laughs> it's a lot. So much stuff. <laughs> this is like a th- this is like a mass like a PhD thesis in like CSS. I know. I feel like this could be like four different episodes. Yeah. I mean, it's years and years of standards work, right? So it's like yes, and so much engineering time. Oh, yeah. And you're doing a fantastic job, by the way. So just thank you <laughs> for making this simple. I'm just here to relay. <laughs> Okay, so with responsive design, I've been framing this as like a a new shift, like a shift in the way that we can now think about responsive design, where before developers really thought about responsive as like screen sizes. Like that was a huge shift. That whole era of being able to create styles for mobile and for desktop and tablet and like having to think about all these different form factors. Now we have new capabilities that you rethink the way that you imagine responsive design because you're no longer relying on the viewport, like the global viewport information to apply these styles, you can look within the page and apply styles that way. And you can also create more logical components. So container queries let us do just that, where you can have all of your styles sort of written in a container mode where you're looking for the actual size of the parent. So that element could be in the sidebar. It could be in like a main list. It could be on a page as a hero. And all of those styles can be self-contained in that element, which makes sense of how people write components today in frameworks. And that's also like another big shift because you used to have these page view styles and then these component level logic and that didn't really mix. Now you can do these component level logical pieces so you can restyle something based on how much space it has. And that can go as narrow as um, I have a demo where I have a responsive button. So you have a button that shows just an icon. Then it gets a little bit bigger. That icon gets more detail. And when that gets a little bit bigger, it gets like a little plus wow. on it. And when that gets bigger, it gets like some text that says add, like add to cart. And eventually it'll show the whole text. And then that could live inside of a responsive card. That could live inside of a page that has like a responsive grid. So it really grows and grows and grows. You could have things really broken down. And that's very, very exciting and a huge shift in how we like think about building responsive interfaces. And then you can combine that also with like macro layouts, like have the whole page, like use media queries to to look at the media and the viewport side, like that where it makes sense, but then have the containers take on their custom styles. And there's a lot that you can do with container queries. There's also uh, style queries that are in Chrome, which let you query for custom property values. So that's something that um, I think will get more useful over time too, uh, as that evolves a bit more. But then one thing that I think is really exciting is using that with the has selector. Have you heard of has? I have, yes. It's been out for a little while now. Um, But for folks who aren't familiar, do you want to just tell us what that is? Yeah. So has is a selector that lets you look for the presence or state of children within an element. And that could be like figure has fig caption. And you could style a figure that has a fig caption with like a border so that it's separated from the rest of the text. You could look for states, like if if a form field has an invalid field and then create like a error message that you go from display none to display block when that happens. You can check for the quantity of children using nth child. So you could do quantity queries to be like, if it has five or more children, style it this way. If it has fewer, style it that way. So you can create like different grids using has. And you can use has on that element, on the parent element. So it's kind of like a parent selector can use has on any of the children inside the parent or siblings around it. So it's really, really powerful unless you like self-contain this logic. Like you could do, if the inbox has 10 or more items, show the pagination bar and then style it that way. And you needed like JavaScript to do this kind of conditional querying in the past, right? Like how would you even do this with CSS without has? Like you couldn't, right? It's very, very, very hacky. Yeah. Okay. Very hacky. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Has is, has is nice. I was really excited to see that. I feel like has was one of the first things that came out a few years ago. And I I think it was still Chromium at the time, but like, I I was just excited to see something new from CSS and it just, the hits have just been like, they've been coming like since then, you know, just (laughs) like, like the hits. Yeah. They really, they really are hits. And like what you were just describing around the, um, kind of the new way of doing responsive design, like that's really phenomenal. Like I, you know, what a, what a time to be starting a greenfield application or to be re-architecting or cleaning up your CSS. Like that is like fantastic. And do you know if that is available on all browsers, um, all evergreen browsers now, or is that just limited to a few browsers? So size container queries are in all browsers. As of February of this year, they landed 
and the last browser on Valentine's Day. So wow. cool. <laughs> what a, um, <laughs> <gift>. <laughs> what a joy. A and then has is almost in all browsers. It's landing in Firefox 121, which goes stable in the end of December. So by the end of this year, we're going to have has and container queries in all browsers. Mm. What an exciting time to be alive. Um, really. I, I mean, I, I feel like I have to ask an obligatory like AI question. Like, you know, do you think AI is going to help us write better CSS? <laughs> um, I think when AI learns how to write CSS, <laughs> AI writes notoriously bad CSS. Oh, okay. Oh, no. It does good to do apps. Like it, it can do that. It's very bad at CSS. Don't you think it's because it's learning from the internet where there's a lot of bad CSS? Yep. Okay, that's what I thought. <laughs> that's it. I couldn't be relying on it for my gradients <laughs> then. We got to teach it better. <laughs> yeah. Gosh. Well, uh, you know, this has been so insightful and so educational. Like, I can't even tell you. Mm -hmm. um, I So many people are going to, like thousands of people are going to benefit from this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for just generally being like a freaking, you're like the ambassador of the web. Oh, it, it happened. Yay. <laughs> so cool. You <laughs> just did it hard. Yeah. I, I, I chose not to do this because I was like, wasn't sure what was going to happen. And now seeing it work on your machine, I'm like, for those of you who are like, what the hell are they talking about? It's um, Una just made a heart with her hands and then just there were hearts that appeared on her screen, you know, like magic because it's 2023. Yeah, your OS is uh, <laughs> it's, it's getting getting cool, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah, just you're like the freaking ambassador of the web, like in mm -hmm. the best of ways. Like you're just a fantastic ambassador. You're always like putting out demo apps and content. And I just want to say thank you so much for like everything that you do. and. Thank you for making everything accessible and approachable. Thank you for just being awesome. Thank you for existing. Thank you for teaching us. I mean, I, I could go on and on. Wow, that's <laughs> yeah, so I mean, nice. It's, it's so true, though. <laughs> right, Nick? I, I totally agree. Yeah. No, I, I really appreciate all you do also for the web community. I feel like, you know, it's awesome to see this kind of community spring up around also like your podcast. It's great. So thank you for having me on the show. I feel like the web is evolving and... I, we have the same goals of helping people like, learn about it and come together. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I, I kind of want to close out with this thought because you said something really insightful earlier that I wasn't able to double click into because it would have taken us on a huge tangent. You talked about like how a lot of these new CSS primitives allow engineers to architect and organize their code and have a better separation of like concerns, like where their styling is not mixed in with their logic. And I'm like, hell yeah, like I want that world. And so can you can you just double click into that a little bit? Like, because I, I thought it was so insightful because I, I do think that is something that we don't really think about enough, which is kind of like, how do we how do we separate those concerns, you know, and, and keep our styling kind of encapsulated and to some degree even progressive, right? Like, how do you have progressive experiences based on what device they're using, based on what's available on their browsers, et cetera? Like, we're not really thinking about that progressive strategy either. And so I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on this. I will also say these are my personal thoughts on it. Like when I talk about this separation of logical styles from like uh, log like application logic from application styles, like that's very much my take on it. So I don't want to be speaking for like the browser when I talk about that. I'm here for your take though. That's the thing. I want to put a big fat mic on your take. So like mm -hmm. <laughs> we're, we're both here for your take. <laughs> like I, I think that that's the goal. Like I am not here to try to tell people to write less JavaScript. I'm trying to help people write applications that are architected in a way that makes sense and write scripting where there are actual event changes and you need to connect things. You need to actually send data. You need to manage the DOM state or manage other parts of the DOM. That makes sense for me for writing scripts. Where it kind of gets murky is like when you have to have an additional library and write JavaScript to do styles like scroll animations, where you have to write a bunch of logic to do scroll observers and resize observers and a bunch of like visual DOM observers that have nothing to do with logic. Like all of that is muddy and messy and prone to errors. And the whole idea behind the component effort was to reduce the accessibility errors on the web platform because people are just recreating these components and missing things because they're so complex to get right in terms of accessibility. There's so many different states to manage. And it shouldn't be a burden on the developer to have to 
think about and manage all those states every single time if it's such a common pattern. And that's where I think that the browser and the web community can help. And the web should be able to take on a lot of those common logical needs and like provide hooks for developers to hook into when there's event changes, send forms, all that stuff. But then not require developers have to reinvent the wheel each time. And especially in a world where that's the future world that I imagine, where like you have this language that applies the styles. Then you have your semantic language, which is within HTML and to hook things up. And then you have your logical piece of the web where you're building applications, you're sending server data, you're like might be building DOM. Like all those things make sense in JavaScript. Not everything makes sense in JavaScript. Like changing the color of a button when you click on it. If there's an event change, like a state change, yeah. If it's like a a hover style or something, maybe not, but you should be able to change the event, change the DOM state in JavaScript, and then apply all the styles that hook into that DOM state change in CSS. Like that's the world that I I see and we're getting to. And there's just a couple of things that are missing. I think also a big change is like the architectural needs right now for the web platform. We need container queries. We need people to start aligning the way that they're building components with the way they're styling them. Like it's still a bit of a disconnect there. So I hope that a lot of these APIs will help bridge the gap, make sense in ways that make sense and kind of improve the legibility and the the maintenance of our systems. Oh, man, to that. Yes. And that's your keynote. The What was it? The golden age? <laughs> that's the golden age keynote? The golden age of CSS. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's the keynote right there. You know. So yes, yes, yes. I want that future. And thank you for kind of distilling all this complex data for us. Our show notes are going to be like worth their weight in gold. So please, everyone check them out. For folks who want to hear more about this and learn about this important topic, you can follow Yuna on Twitter. And she's like an amazing person to follow, but also you can listen to her podcast, right? So if you have a podcast, you want to tell us about that? Yeah, so I have a podcast called The CSS Podcast. Uh, This season, Adam, my co-host, and me are covering common CSS questions like, why isn't my percentage working or why is this image stretching? So that's kind of where we talk about CSS stuff more. But then also, if you want to follow along, web.dev and developer.chrome.com are where our team writes about these topics. And we will do an end of year like little wrapped review thing like what happened in 2023 so i'm excited for that moment because putting it together really gives me perspective on like how much has changed and a lot of it is stable and it's really cool to see how far we've come in a year like i thought we did a lot in 2021 we did even more in 2022 we've done even more in 2023 for the web so as you said amel it's a really exciting time to be a developer i would say alive but yes that too definitely a developer yes to, to be alive but great time um, to be writing javascript because hopefully you'll be writing less of it <laughs> and also by the way if you're a javascript developer and you felt attacked by me it's because i'm frustrated i'm frustrated our community because we refuse to learn this other part. It's like saying, I want to be a doctor, but I don't want to talk to patients or something like that. Or I want to be a doctor, (laughs) but I don't want to touch anyone. Or like, it's a ridiculous, like we are engineers writing for the web. We have to learn CSS period. Like, and I speak to myself by the way, before anyone else. Right. But it's just this thing that we just refuse to take seriously. And it really, really impacts our users. It impacts our code. It impacts our ability to deliver elegant and simple solutions, you know, it's so many things. It limits our ability to kind of evolve and keep up with all these great features, right? Like if I'm still writing CSS, like it's 1995 and, you know, it's 2023 and all these cool things are coming out. Like, I'm just like, I'm so behind on the curve, right? So yeah, so everyone, like we, we got, we got to get it together, kids. Okay. Like take this stuff seriously. Follow Yuna, follow Adam, listen to their podcast, check out the show links. And we just want to say thank you again. So Nick, any any last words <laughs> before we call this a wrap? I think you nailed it. 100% agree with everything you said. Yuna, thank you so much for coming on and, and talking about all of this. Uh, there really is so many exciting things that I didn't even know were there. And the problem with me, I I wanted to bring this up and I won't, I won't uh, you know, get us onto another tangent or anything, but I end up treating CSS these days a lot like I treat JavaScript in that I don't look at what's coming new in JavaScript. I look at what's in something that I can use today. And that's, for me, 
what does TypeScript support? <laughs> so like they'll pre-support of course, those features. Of course he had to bring up TypeScript. <laughs> OMG. Oh. oh, but that wasn't that wasn't even it. I was gonna say when it comes to the CSS features, I look at what Tailwind supports oh and then God. I go that way. Can we can we talk about um, how I hate Tailwind, by the way, everybody? I'm gonna say that on air. I, I went to this React <laughs> conference and had some it's most it's a lot of React community folks. Had a triggering experience. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> well, I heard a bit of that, which is like, oh, for CSS, if it's not in Tailwind, I'm not going to use it. That's sort of the oh, world. So sad. Um, but that's why I started meeting with Adam Watham from Tailwind, like monthly, to make sure Aww. that Tailwind is like aware of the features. They've been adding a lot of the features as well to that system. I I feel like whatever works best for you, you should use. So as a proponent of the web platform, I want to make sure that people like you, Nick, who rely on Tailwind to tell you what's new in CSS, <laughs> um, have access to these new features as well. I, I do think like you can't do everything in Tailwind. Agreed. I think it's a great tool for, you know, prototyping other cases where it could work well with the team as well. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of benefits to it. But I do think that there's a point in which you can't do every single thing mm -hmm. and you're going to probably benefit from learning some of the features that you can't access in Tailwind yeah. um, that you can do in CSS. 100%. So I, I, I feel like that's something that we can better as a community is just to educate ourselves more on what's yeah. out there. And for the record, I don't think that you can effectively use Tailwind without really understanding CSS. No, oh, I think the internet's going to prove you wrong on that, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> that's my issue with Tailwind is like people don't understand what it's doing sort of behind the the hood under the hood um, so they'll memorize these tailwind classes but they won't know what the property value pair which is takes the same amount of characters to type <laughs> or like what it is <laughs> i agree i agree but i'm not i don't hate on tailwind i i think like use the tool that's best for you for sure for me it's just an easier way to conform i have no shame on hating on tailwind for what it's worth just for the record i am obviously not yeah, you and I, we're different people, different opinions. <laughs> For me, it's just an easier way to get a team to conform to a design system uh, because... It's or you could have a design system. Yes. Yeah. Thank, well, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for saying that. But it... A lot of it is like, it depends. And if that's what works best for your team, then it's what works best for your team. And you've made the educated decision and trade-off. Yeah. And and I'm putting my tech lead hat on. Just understand the costs of your abstractions, kids. Okay? Mm -hmm. Like, everything has a cost, you know? And waiting for Tailwind to add a feature when it's available on the web platform is, for me, that's too high of a cost. And so, uh, just just putting it out there. But yeah, I, I, it's probably best that I end this podcast now because I, I don't want to <laughs> continue like dragging on. It's a tool again. I'm making my my beef is with the API. It's not with the people behind the tool. So thank you for everyone who work work on it. There's some things that are easy to add to Tailwind. Like you could easily add like one liners, like um, text wrap balancing. It's harder to add things like scroll driven animations. You know, it's harder to add things like scoped styles, like for the user to use. You have to. That's not a part of the Tailwind system. That's a part of how you write your styles that probably include Tailwind. Like th that's kind of also a thing where you don't get access to everything the web provides if you rely on one library. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's very very well said. I totally like like I said, I think that you definitely have to have a firm understanding of CSS to to use it effectively and to understand when it makes sense. But the key point is like CSS is definitely worth learning wh whether you use it or not. Through Tailwind or not. <laughs> yeah. I'm okay. The, the, I'm waiting for the. Nick, this the, is the last time I'm giving you a. Um, <laughs> this is the last time I'm giving you last word, okay? Just putting it out there. <laughs> you first, he brings oh, up TypeScript. Oh, wow. That's so cool. I've been trying to get these fireworks to show up, but they won't show up. I'm doing like the double thumbs up. Oh. Maybe maybe because you're smiling and you're doing a thumbs down. So maybe if you okay, so we're now we're 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 being <laughs> bad podcast toasts because we're just Oh there we go. We're messing with I our got videos. The fireworks. Okay, that's exciting. All right. Okay, everyone. Amazing show. Thank you to our guest. Please, please click on the show links. Learn CSS. We love you all. See you next week. Cheers. Bye. All right. That is JS Party for this week. Thanks for hanging with us. If you dig the show, share it with your friends and colleagues. Word of mouth is the number one way people find new podcasts they love. 
And if you love what we're up to, hit us up with a five-star review. We love those. Thanks once again to our partners, Fassy.com, Fly.io, and Typesense.org. And to our beat freaking residents, Breakmaster Cylinder. We can't get enough of that robot dance makeout music. That's all for now. But come back and party with us again next week.